And welcome back to Newsmax. Now, after a groundbreaking, you'd probably say a couple weeks, uh, yeah. what's next for President Barack Obama? You know, the list is long, and my instructions to my team and my instructions to myself have always been that we are going to squeeze every last ounce of, uh, of progress that we can make uh, when I have the privilege of, as long as I have the privilege of holding this office. President Obama began work on his to-do list on Tuesday, unveiling a plan to make more U.S. workers eligible for overtime pay. Okay. He also tried to marshal business and labor to pressure Congress to renew the charter for the U.S. Export-Import Bank, and that's a great place now to bring in our roundtable. Joining us now is host of The Agenda and former advisor to Senate Minority Leader Harry Reid, Ari raven -Hoff. Also joining us is political and economic analyst Raul Moss. Thank you both for being with us. I got to tell you though guys, when I look at Twitter, I see a lot of Washington Beltway types talking about this XM Bank. Some say it's corporate welfare or others say it's vital for global trade. One side says it's a job killer for US workers, the other side say it's a crucial part of the economic engine of America. Are you first? Tell us what the XM Bank is and do we really need it? Um, look, the XM Bank is a bank that essentially, if Boeing wants to sell an airplane to a foreign country, those are expensive transactions that take place sometimes over decades, and therefore you need some special financing, and the XM Bank handles that financing. Is it corporate welfare? Yeah, probably. Do other countries provide the same services to their large corporations? Yes. Do I care if it's renewed? Eh. Like, I... I think it's one of those issues that lobbyists and Washington types care about. Average Americans don't even know what the export exactly. bank is. Um, I, like, I can't get revved up on it on either <laughs> side, frankly, because, look, if we're going to have a, a real conversation about a realistic industrial policy in this country, like, so the Export-Import Bank is small potatoes compared to what we actually need to do. So that's something for, like, lobbyists from the Chamber of Commerce and senators from Washington state to get excited about. I'm not really going to get excited. Like, do I think it should exist? Probably. Do I care? Not really. Right. And that's the thing. Some people act like it is in in completely vital to uh, the future of this nation. Ari, Ari did a pretty or, good job breaking that was it down. A great, well, he, worked in, it. He, yeah. knows, he knows these types of things. What about you, Raul? What do you think about the XM so, Bank? Uh, are I, your I, eyes glazing over here? Find, Can we move on? I never thought I'd find myself saying this, but I think I actually agree with, uh, with uh, Ari here. I mean, um, uh, let me let me take my my political conservative hat off for a second and talk as someone who spent 30 years in the banking business, most of it in international banking. Um, if if you think about what the Exim Bank does, and if you are in fact a firm believer in free market capitalism, you would tell yourself, you know what, uh, this doesn't really uh, fit into the scheme of what's generally perceived to be free market capitalism. The problem is that. There's about 60 countries throughout the world that have similar institutions, all of whom are supporting their industries at home to compete with us abroad. And yes, big companies like Boeing and General Electric are the main beneficiaries of that. But when you look at the amount of uh, exports that the U.S. sends overseas, the biggest products that we sell are 747s and 787s, you know, huge turbines made by General Electric. Those are the things that really make a huge impact on our balance of trade. And a lot of small companies feed off of those huge contracts that Boeing and other companies have. All right, fair enough. And, and you know, we don't want to go too deep in on this because as Ari said, it's not really relevant to most Americans, but it is a topic of discussion that we hear about. Okay. And it comes up in other conversations. Uh, you know, some have brought up the disagreements that the Obama administration has uh, on this discussion about the XM Bank because he wants to see it continue. And it mm -hmm. kind of ties into the similar fights he had with liberals when it comes to this trade deal uh, discussion. And a uh, liberal commentator, pundit Brent Badowski, writing uh, in his column today, there is a progressive way throughout the Democratic Party and the national politics, which is why Hillary Clinton is wisely staking out progressive positions. And Senator Bernie Sanders mm -hmm. is the surprise early star mm -hmm. of the 26th <laughs> Uh, 2016 campaign, yet Obama continues to periodically lapse into ridicule and derision of liberals and labor as he did during the recent trade debate. Uh, Ari, is President Obama, by taking this tack, hurting Democrats' chances in 2016? No, I think this has always been a kind of interceding fight within the party between two camps. I think 
trade has always been from uh, in the 90s you saw the same thing happen with uh, Bill Clinton and uh, NAFTA where Bill Clinton was strongly supporting NAFTA and the unions and congressional Democrats were opposed look I find myself on the opposing side of things mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. TPP and fast track but things tend to get quickly resolved in election years everyone comes together and pushes and pushes together and all these fights get forgotten I'll leave you last word, Raul, with about 20 seconds left to go. This also puts Hillary in a difficult spot, too, because it forces her almost to run against her president, her husband, who, when he was I mean, president. Uh, you know, Hillary's definitely having to push towards the left. I mean, Bernie Sanders and others are making a big issue of, of, of the trade deals. Um, and, and again, I mean, it, I, I think it is causing some internal friction. Yeah. But All I right. We'll leave that. We'll leave that conversation there. It's uh, maybe not that interesting, but some would say important. We touched All upon right. it. We did our, our good work. We'll talk about something a little bit more fun when we come back. Yeah, right? speaking of trade, we're going to talk about Cuba. That's next when our roundtable continues. And we welcome you back for part two of our roundtable discussion. With us again, host of The Agenda and former advisor to Senate Minority Leader Harry Reid, Ari Rabenhoff, and also with us, political and economic analyst Raul Moss. And I just want to apologize for everybody. There's an inner <clears throat> policy wonk inside me, and it came out with that XM Bank discussion, and uh, I won't do that to us again. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's okay. We all forgiven, right? I think we're good. My inner, wonk, right. my inner wonk came out. But let's move on to a topic that people are actually talking about in, uh, in <laughs> that sounds good that sounds in, good in a lot of corners of america president barack obama announcing yesterday that the u.s and cuba have struck a deal to reopen embassies in each other's uh, capitals re-establishing diplomatic relations this is a historic step forward in our efforts to normalize relations with the cuban government and people and begin a new chapter with our neighbors in the americas you can't hold the future of cuba hostage to what happened in the past However, at the same time, there have been certain uh, calls for promises and assurances from the Cuban government. Raul, do you think those assurances exist yet? Listen, I haven't seen anything come out of this agreement, quite frankly, that benefits the Cuban people. In fact, here in Miami, you know, we continue to see the Coast Guard picking up migrants that are leaving Cuba in droves because, quite frankly, the situation for the people in Cuba uh, has not changed. Uh, I mean, the whole idea, uh, in my mind, behind reestablishing diplomatic ties with Cuba is not just to benefit American capitalists who want to export goods there or Americans that want to travel there to sort of work on their suntan. You know, we have serious issues about freedom and democracy on the island. I do not think that they were properly addressed by this president as part of those negotiations. Um, he's more concerned with his legacy and, and, and sort of reestablishing diplomatic ties than I think actually making an impact on the lives of ordinary Cubans, and that's why I'm critical of this decision, because I simply do not see the Cubans having to um, give up anything in the process and really begin to open their society. Hmm. I want to ask you, Raul, uh, I had talked to John about this, and there's been numerous articles about this, about businesses going over there, very excited about this, thinking that we have something to financially gain by doing this. Do you agree? I mean, you're in Listen, Miami. I see business trips any, happening all the time. Any business person who's going to Cuba needs to keep in mind that the reason that the embargo was established in the first place is because the Castro brothers back in the early 60s basically confiscated over a billion dollars worth of property, most of it belonging to U.S. shareholders, the, the Cuban electric company that was owned by Americans, a variety of different industries uh, and properties that were basically owned by American interests. None of that's been taken care of. I mean, that, that is still an issue. There's been no, you know, uh, agreement reached in terms of making amends for that seizure of property. There are no laws that protect investors in Cuba. This is still an authoritarian communist regime. Right. The embargo is still in place in Congress. It has not been you know, done away with. Well, all right, let's get you to jump in here because I want to get you to respond to something that Senator Marco Rubio uh, said yesterday, releasing a statement saying, quote, it is important for the United States to continue being a beacon of freedom for the Cuban people and tend to work with my colleagues to block the administration's efforts to pursue diplomatic relations with Cuba and name an ambassador to Havana until substantive uh, progress is made on these important issues, those issues being the freedom of American uh, diplomats who roam Cuba and more protection for Cuban dissidents. Uh, I know you support the opening of this, but do we need to get more assurances uh, from the Cuban government before we proceed any further? Look, I feel like we have PNTR with China. We sell F-16s to Saudi Arabia. You know, you go down the list of brutal, repressive regimes we deal with on a daily basis in our government going back 30 years, 40 years, Republicans and Democrats. Then we have a regime that, yeah, has significant problems in terms of freedom, in terms of, you know, across the board, right? 
but our policies have clearly not worked over the past 70 years. Our policies in Cuba have clearly failed, and especially our embargo over the past 50 plus years. So I think it's time to start rethinking how we deal with, with, that, with that island nation off the coast of our shores. And I think there have been a, such insane policies driven from that, things like TV Marty, which is a complete boondoggle of taxpayer dollars, down the, and that's the smallest thing, down the line that have been ridiculous, and that, and that we should look for, if a policy is failing for decades, perhaps it's time to change it. Yeah, and we, do you think it will help the people of Cuba? Look, I don't know what will help the people of Cuba at this point. Clearly, our current policies have not helped the people of Cuba because there's still all the problems we've had in Cuba. So I'm willing to try something new here. Like I Look, I sympathize with the people of Cuba who have to live under a repressive, pr repressive regime, just like I sympathize with women in Saudi Arabia and dissidents in China who have to live under repressive regimes. But we've chosen different uh, paths sorry, in different you, countries, you, you and pay, I'm going to you see pay what lip, works. You pay lip service to it, okay? But when you okay. criticize something like TV Barty, which, by the way, I've been on on numerous occasions, it was actually started by my late brother. Uh, very, very proud of that organization. It is one of the few sources of free and unfettered information that the Cuban people receive, and they do jammed. get it, believe it or not, as well as the radio transmissions that go over into the island. And that is, in fact, a beacon of hope for the island that should they're, remain. They're uh, but, jammed. But, you know, I'm fine with a broadcast, sort of, but it's jammed. Sort of turning over. The United States does not need All right, Cuba. well, gentlemen, we are out of time. Uh, fascinating discussion. You know, we know this is going to continue to go on as these embassies open up. We'll revisit the conversation uh, when things do progress. All right, Raven Hoff, Raul Moss, thank you both for being with us here on Newsmax Now.